Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where or when you're watching this. This is Cat with Cat's Corner, also known as Artistic Cat. And I wanted to do a brush primer for you. Um, I get a lot of questions about what brush should I use? What brushes do you use? And so I've gathered my favorite brushes together um, and I've selected a synthetic, a natural, and a natural mix. And I wanna kind of show exactly which what they do and which ones I use. Um, so if you'll kind of hang with me as I'm dusting off my video editing skills for the first time in about a year and a half, we'll try to quickly get through what brushes I use and um, why I use them. So there's a couple things you wanna look at when you're gonna be putting down some money on a watercolor brush. Um, first of all, that you can get quite good brushes from Cheap Joe's, Daniel Smith, Dick Blick, Windsor Newton. And that's because um, Da Vinci and Escada have a tendency to make those brushes under a private label for those companies. So you don't always have to go for a Da Vinci brush or an Escada brush. I love both of those brushes, don't get me wrong, but I've also actually come across some really good brushes from Daniel Smith and Cheap Joe's. So what are the ideal brush qualities? Um, this gets into more watercolor. Um, versus mixed media, but they're valuable information nonetheless. So you want a clean shape. You don't want any of the um, stray hairs or splaying hairs off the side of the tuft. You want nice, even cut. They should look nice and pretty. Um, you want large capacity or do you want less capacity? Um, a natural brush pulls over the most capacity of water and paint. Um, a synthetic brush the least amount and we'll see that later in the video um, does it have consistent release or flow when the brush is, has all the fluid in it does the brush release the paint at a steady continuous flow um, you'll also see that in the demonstration I have a little bit later um, wicking does it pick water and paint back up um, not something I'm going to demonstrate today but um, it actually has a lot to do with how well the paintbrush holds the paint as it's letting down the flow as well. Um, does it have spring? The synthetic brushes have a lot of spring. Um, natural brushes have pretty much no spring. Um, so a mix is gonna have the two together. That has a lot to do with the brush stroke and if you're putting it down, whether or not um, everything becomes kind of a muddled your brush stroke becomes kind of a muddled soft mess or whether they have very specific um, strokes uh, lines in your brush stroke uh, makes a different really just difference to the artist itself you're going to get the most brush stroke from a synthetic i find that the in between gives you a nice in between you don't need to worry about um, does it balance in your hand properly does it as it does it have ease of cleaning um, does it shed? Shedding is a large um, problem because if you're putting down watercolor and you have a nice pretty wash and you get a hair in it, you'll have to go back in and try to tweeze the hair out or the hair will collect pigment around it and ruin your wash. Um, you typically don't want to ever touch the ends of the tufts with your fingers. This is one of my really bad habits. Um, a... Uh, value of the brush is really important um, $150 Kalinsky round sable brush should last many many years of daily use um, and an inexpensive brush depending on the way you use it will last a, a lot more a lot less time um, but I've found that typically you can actually buy quite an inexpensive brush and it lasts quite a long time as well. What you don't want is to spend an extreme amount of money on a brush and then have it not last very long. And that's where doing some research makes it makes a difference with it. Um, and the last part is how do you remove the manufacturer's starch coating? So you get a brush and it's hard as a rock and you're like, what on earth am I gonna do with this? So what you wanna do is wash your hands, wet the brush for a minute or two under a stream of water and then gently apply pressure to the tuft, pinching it with your thumb and index finger working it around the sides of the tuft. And you'll, over the time, it'll kind of loosen up 
you know, I soak it a little bit longer, let it set out wet. And so when the starch is gone, you can just rinse it out. It usually takes a minute or two to get it kind of out. Um, a lot of shops will actually have a brush for you to test, especially if you're looking at a really expensive brush and you're in a larger city. Um, they will have a set of brushes that you can test before you go and you spend $30, $40, $100 on a brush. But for our purposes and what we do at Cat's Corner, um, most of the brushes I use are in the $10 range. Um, and I do have some really, really, really nice watercolor brushes when I really want to do a big watercolor piece that it's really important that I'm using a very specific brush for a technique that I like. All right, so I'm gonna try to do this as scientifically as possible. I've tried to put the same amount of paint into each one of these palette wells. Um, this is Quinac Quinacridone Gold from Daniel Smith. Um, I felt like this was a really good test of the brushes. I'm gonna mix this up with a certain amount of drops of water in each one until I'm happy with the mix. I'll let you know how many I use, and then I'll show you exactly how much each brush holds from load um, uh, on this paper. This paper is uh, Fabriano Studio Watercolor, cold press. Um, it is 25% cotton, so it's not a complete cotton rag. Um, I use this as a, a lot. Um, this is my test paper. This is anytime I'm doing swatches, anytime I'm needing to test a color, this is what I grab. This is um, inexpensive and it's great for um, just doing everything, including doing even small um, pieces on. I don't do any large watercolor pieces on this ever or small final watercolor pieces on it ever. I use um, arches. So I'll get to mixing and then we will um, test the brushes. So I want to make a little comment here to what I'm doing. Um, I'm not obviously using one of the pans that we sell in our Etsy shop. I'm using paint out of a tube. Um, but you never want to take a good brush and use it in the pans. And the reason being is that when you go to use a brush in a pan that doesn't have a lot of water in it, you could do it if you have some water in the pan, but I don't use my good brushes in my pans. I always put water in my pan and then I swish it around and then dump that paint out into one of these little wells. But um, you'll see me mixing here with uh, a synthetic brush used for acrylic. And that's because you do a fair amount of wear and tear when you do this type of mixing. I'm wanting to get a nice juicy um, combination of paint here. And I don't want to use the really nice bristles of my good brushes for this process. The other thing is that when you're doing it out of a tube like this, you need to make sure that you mix the paint really, really well. Otherwise, you will suck up into your brush one of these pieces of rough pigment like you see right here. And if, if you do that, it's going to leave that mark onto the paper. Um, and so if you're trying to get a really nice sky down, that is something you really don't want to do. I'm going to fast forward through the rest of this. Um, as I'm mixing it up, but I am trying to put the same amount of water into each one of these wells And there's a real good reason I'm going to do that and that is that at the very end of this I'm going to show you how much water or pig water and pigment each of the brushes soaks up out of the wells And so you have a better visual idea of what the difference is between these three brushes So why are there so many different types of water? First of all, we'll handle the misnomers. And that is that an artist, as an artist gets better, they just increase their brush expense. That you start with a cheap brush, you work through your better brushes. Um, this is yes and no, and we'll explain why that's the case. Um, the other thing you'll hear is that you must buy Sable or you must buy a Kalinsky Sable brush. And while these are the top end brushes, and I do have some Kalinsky Sables that I'm working with today, Actually, you don't have to do that. Um, my everyday brushes are not um, Kalinsky Sable brushes, mainly because they're expensive, and because they're expensive, they're not your workhorse brush. So the first question I get asked the most is, what size should I buy? And size of brush does not have anything to do with detail in the way that you think it does. Most really good brushes have a very fine tip. 
you can actually do an enormous amount of detail with a size 10 brush. What it does make a difference with is how much paint water gets transferred to the paper at what rate, and they consider that the flow. So if you take a size 10 brush and you try to use that on your notebook, you're going to put way too much um, paint mixture onto your paper. So they use shorter bristles and smaller brushes for detail, not because so much the size of the um, tip, but actually that it doesn't hold a lot of pigment. And so you can actually control better the detail that you're putting in. In turn, if you have a half sheet piece of watercolor and you're trying to use um, an eight, say, to put in a wash or to put in a, a, a large amount of pigment, you are not going to be very successful with that because it's not holding enough liquid in the actual tip of the brush to successfully make um, a flow of paint out on the brush out on the paper. And you'll see this actually in the final uh, piece here that shows um, results of putting down the uh, pigment on to the paper. You'll see that the brushes did a different job with um, a granulated paint as far as letting that pigment down onto the paper. So we're going to deal with three types of brushes today. Synthetic, a natural and a mix of natural and synthetic fibers. Um, natural is most often referred to as the Kalinske Sable, but in this case, we're going to talk about squirrel a little bit too, because um, a lot of good brushes actually have a combination of Kalinske Sable and squirrel or another natural hair so that um, it cuts the price down a little bit, but also it has a little bit more spring to it. The fourth type that I've got on here is Synthetic Natural. These are more uh, newer brushes. Um, they are meant to completely mimic natural brushes, but they are a synthetic fiber. So the Princeton Neptune are synthetic squirrel brushes. They're meant to act like squirrel, but they are synthetic. There are equally ones that are synthetic Kalinske. So they have the properties of Kalinske uh, Sable, but they are truly a synthetic brush. So why would you own a synthetic brush? Um, two reasons. One, you don't want to move very much pigment and water over to the paper. And two, you want to disturb the paint that's already on the paper with the brush. So you can actually put a little water down over the edge of um, some paint and rub it with the brush and the paint will often move depending on the paper uh, and the paint. So um, that is the main reason you would own a fully synthetic brush. So the first brush I'm going to show you here today is a completely synthetic brush. It's made by Da Vinci. It's a Cosmotop spin. I have a number eight with me here. And as you can see here, I've mixed up the Daniel Smith paint and it puts a very little amount over onto the paper in one move. So you have to work pretty hard to kind of scoop it up in the bristles. And once you get over to the paper, you only get a few swatches before you're out. And that is um, really what makes painting with synthetic brushes very hard. So why would we use a mixed brush? Um, mixed brushes have a combination of synthetic and traditional hair. They have the best of both worlds. They are more economical. Um, they have better durability, and they also put uh, a significant amount of pigment and water over onto your paper with the least amount of fuss underneath. So the second brush I have here is a Da Vinci Cosmotop Mix F brush. It's a mix of um, Kalinske Sable, I believe, with um, some squirrel in it. I will list the details down um, below and uh, along with some synthetic fibers. This is my workhorse brush when I'm doing most of my watercolors. You can see that it's very different uh, as far as lay down than the synthetic brush. It goes much further down the page. The pigments come out of the tip much, much, much easier. Um, it also picks more paint up 
into the fibers and lays it down on the paper a lot more smoother. So why would someone spend big money on a natural hairbrush? Most importantly, watercolor artists use natural hairbrushes because they hold a tremendous amount of pigment, they flow extremely well onto the paper, and they don't must dried paint underneath. So you can glaze over and over again. So do you need one of these type brushes if you're a mixed media or a notebook, what I call a notebook artist or sketchbook artist? I would say no. I would say that you can get away with a mixed brush just fine or a completely synthetic natural brush. Um, there's no reason to go for these high-end brushes unless you're doing large watercolor pieces on arches paper and you're pulling out all the stops. The other brush that we have here is what I would consider my workhorse all-natural brush. And the main reason I use all-natural brushes is actually to soak paint back up off the paper or to put water down. I transfer pigments with my um, F brush and not my B brush. So this is a, a Da Vinci Cosmotop Mix B and it is completely natural has no synthetic fibers in it whatsoever. And you can see that it soaks up even more liquid than the um, mix brush does, and it lays it down completely different. Um, as you can see, you get much more distance as far as how much paint it holds. Also, you can now start to see some variations um, in the pigment that's coming down, the flow off the brush just is much more smooth. But you can also see that it laid down a fair amount of a pool at the start of it. Um, they call that the kiss. And sometimes that's wanted, sometimes it's not. You just kind of have to get a feel for that. So the fourth grouping of brushes that we have here today is called a um, synthetic natural. You'll see this listed as a synthetic squirrel or synthetic uh, Kalinsky, and they are more economical and they are meant to fill the niche that's needed for nicer brushes that don't contain any natural hair whatsoever, but act like a natural brush. And so I have a Princeton Neptune synthetic um, squirrel hair that you're seeing on screen. You can see this is a quill brush. See how much paint it picks up in one go. It will go all the way down this page and then it will start over again and keep going um, down the next page. These are considered mop brushes. Um, they lay down the granulation a little differently, but if you want a nice, smooth, consistent color all the way down, they're wonderful for that or they're great for um, moving water over onto a painting. So I pulled one more brush out that I use quite a bit. It's actually a very, very inexpensive golden talcon brush made by Princeton, and it's called a snap brush. And as you can see here, it actually does a pretty good job at getting a fair amount of color down. This is not a number eight. Um, this one is a 12 and uh, it has a nice tip on it. And I use this a lot in my net notebook. Um, I think because it's nice, it's durable, but I wanted to show you that not all synthetics are um, considered equal. This is extremely inexpensive. Okay, so we'll get this all dried up here and we'll take a look at the final result. So the first column is the high quality synthetic. The second is the high quality mix. The third is the high quality natural. The fourth is the medium quality um, synthetic squirrel. And the fifth is an inexpensive synthetic. You can look at the two synthetics on the right and see that they look very similar. And notice that that rich color is not in those. And that has to do with the fact that those brushes don't actually let all the paint out of them. They tend to hold on to the bigger particles and they don't get deposited on the paper. And that's what we're seeing in the third sample directly in the middle. 
That's your highest quality. That's a Kalinsky Sable brush. And it's letting everything out at a nice even rate. That's why we have the color that way. Um, and on the first and the second, the first being high quality synthetic, it does a pretty good job, but you'll see that the little specks of paint are not very evenly distributed. And then the second, it's actually so evenly distributed that you're actually not seeing them quite a bit. This is the same amount of paint the, um, used in each of the little um, wells mixed up at the exact same time and five different brushes. So if synthetic's not that great and natural brushes are really fantastic, why own a mix of the two? Well, um, for one thing, we've talked about the fact that natural brushes put down an enormous amount of water and paint. Well, sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you actually just want to bring over kind of half that amount of water and paint. Or um, maybe you don't want to use that really expensive brush for everyday painting. That's where a mix brush comes in really well. It has the durability of synthetic without having the um, high price tag of a natural brush. So you can get the best of both worlds. The cost is better. Um, my everyday brushes are almost always mixed brushes. So are all natural brushes created equal? They are not. They range from the most expensive brushes out there, Kolinsky Sable brushes, all the way down to the cheapest brush that you can buy. That's natural hair, which is like a goat hair um, brush, which um, are also used for acrylic. But um, a soft goat hair brush, like a hockey brush, is used for transferring water over to watercolor paper. And they absorb an enormous amount of water. So you're able to put down a lot of water very quickly on a piece of watercolor paper. In between there, you'll find Squirrel. Um, I actually love Squirrel brushes. They uh, have a, a great resiliency. They do a very good job at putting flow of water down onto paper, sometimes a little too much. And I've got a Squirrel mop here to kind of show you how that looks too. I wanna thank you for hanging out with me through this really long video, the ups and downs of audio. Um, as I break in my video skills. Hopefully this information was useful to you the next time you go to the store and you're oogling a uh, really pretty brush or that your favorite artist tells you that their favorite brush is XYZ and you're wondering why or why they spent as much as they did on it because sometimes out of 10 they have a tendency to be rather expensive. So um, take care and we'll catch you next time.